Welcome to the full story series where we go into some of our older videos and create a compilation of things that we feel are related or a complete story of like two hours of content. Today we thought it would be fun to go back through all of the evil Batman that came out of the Dark Knight's Metal event. So today we're going to be bringing you the origin stories of those seven Batman from the original event and then we're going to throw in the Grim Knight one. As a fun reminder, just as a way to look at the Dark Knight's Metal Batman that came out of that whole thing. I hope you guys enjoy, and you can find the full Dark Knight's Metal playlist down below if you just want to watch the whole thing again. Stop me if you've heard this one. Worlds will live. Worlds will die. But imagine if your every fear, every bad decision, gave birth to a malformed world of nightmares. A world that shouldn't exist, and desperate as it fights to survive in the world of the true multiverse far above. Welcome to the dark multiverse, home to the stories that never should be. It's all one big cosmic joke, except no one is laughing on this side. Well, almost no one. Listen close. Now this is a story of a world's end. A world transformed. Witness the rise of the Dark Knight. On Earth minus 52, the world is ending. Bodies are being pulled up into the dark red sky of death. And the Flash is running through it shouting, It's getting worse. Central City is coming apart. We shouldn't be fighting. This may make you wonder, who is the Flash talking to? A lightning bolt hits down in front of him, stopping him, and as he dodges it, the fire scorches the earth to his side, while ice hits the other side of him. He turns back to this person. This is bigger than both of us. We have to do something before it's too late. And the person he's talking to is someone desperate. Batman. And he has each of the rogue's tools, the cold gun, the weather wizard wand, the heat gun, and the mirror gun, all at his side. As usual, you're late, Flash. It's time for you to let someone else have the speed force. Batman, I told you I won't give you the speed force. I've lost people I love too, but... Batman raises the cold glasses. Then you should understand. If you don't help me willingly, I'll make you. Flash begins to charge up his speed force. You know the things I've done. The mistakes that I've made with these powers in the past. It's impossible to be everywhere at once. Batman looks back at him. Unlike you, I tried to be. And it cost me my family. And that's when we see a flashback of a graveyard of the Bat family dead. Flash runs up to him, so Batman leaps out of the way, going through a mirror with the Mirror Master gun to dodge him. Why do you think you're going to succeed with the rogue's weapons when they couldn't, Batman? And the Batmobile comes crashing through the wall. You're right. My toys are better. I didn't have to come to this, Flash. I asked for your help, and you rejected me. If our roles were flipped, I would have used every tool at my disposal to get you what you needed. Metallic batarangs go flying through the air, and the Flash dodges, telling him, I said no because your plans for the Speed Force are a dark path to run. I can see you hurting and desperate. Bullets begin to fly as the Flash continues to dodge. After my parents are murdered, I traveled the world to learn everything about science, martial arts, and the supernatural. To become Batman! But it wasn't enough. Not for Jason, Tim, Dick, and Damien. Gotham did what it always does. It takes and takes and takes. I need to find a way to stay one step ahead. Batman gets out of the Batmobile, throwing a gas grenade at the ground. And with each day, I feel myself getting older and slower. I need the Speed Force, Flash. Flash throws a lightning bolt into the gas, hitting Batman with all of it. He then stands over the fallen and defeated Batman. I'm sorry for what happened to your family. I am. But it won't end there. We have to figure out how to save everyone. Together. Batman tries to collect himself. You're right. You're a good friend, Flash. I can always count on you and your compassion. He turns and freezes the Flash's leg in place, and then with one punch, he knocks him out. The Flash wakes up with his mask torn, asking, where am I? And then he realizes what Batman has done. He has chained the Flash to the front of the Batmobile, and he's driving at top speed as the Flash calls out, what are you doing? Batman explains, I studied your design for the cosmic treadmill, and I repurposed its engine to let me harness your connection to the speed force. I'm going to race into it and steal your connection. The Flash looks back, trying to turn his head with the chains holding him in place. Bruce, don't! The mistake I made when I vowed to my parents that I would save Gotham is that I was thinking too small, Barry. I should have promised to save the world. He hits the gas pedal to the floor and it roars as they begin to see the wall of the Speed Force breaking. Flash screams out, You can't access the Speed Force this way! You can't force it! It's going to rip us both apart! The lightning courses in front of them exploding and something twisted, something deranged begins to happen. I know, Barry. No! I'm sorry. Please, Bruce! But now we can save the world. Bruce! And their faces begin to tear apart as Bruce tells him, Together. Flash looks back at him with nothing more than a skull. You can't give up like this, Bruce. 
There's hope, Bruce. There is always. But with that, they are both torn to pieces. Across Gotham City, every rogue in Batman's gallery is suddenly and quickly torn apart and killed because no longer is there Batman. No longer is there Flash. There is something else. And as he kills every villain at a speed unheard of in Gotham, he tells himself and himself, my name is Bruce Wayne. But there's another voice in his head. No, Bruce, don't kill. I'm vengeance. Stop this, Bruce. I am justice. Stop this, Bruce. Don't. I am Batman, Red Death. Please, Bruce, stop. Before, I used to spend so much time alone on the rooftops, dwelling on my actions, but now I don't have to think twice about the Speed Force. It released me. I have saved Gotham, and now I will save the world. I finally have all of the time that I need. But the whole time, the voice in the back of his head, the voice of Barry Allen is telling him to stop this. And regardless of saving Gotham, Batman finally sees the larger problem as Wayne Tower begins to fall at the end of the world. He looks up to see the sky is torn apart. The world is breaking apart, and I'm not fast enough to save it. But there's something deep down that hopes that I can do it, that I can save everyone. And another voice speaks, the one of the Batman who laughs. Even if it means the destruction of another world, would you sacrifice others to save yours? Barry pulls himself free of Bruce for a second. Bruce, it's Barry, stay away from him, don't listen. But Bruce shakes his head, pulling Barry back inside, reaffirming his connection to the Speed Force. What? Who are you? Someone very much like you. Someone who lost his world simply because it was born down here. Our worlds aren't meant to last. They're destined to die. It's a cruel law of nature in this place. You can feel it yourself, can't you? Your time was meant to end. But what if I told you that there was a world far, far above that was destined to live? Batman puts on his mask asking, tell me more. Over on Earth Zero, the first world of the multiverse, the evil Batman of the multiverse have now all arrived in issues one and two of Metal, which we have on the channel. You can watch it, I'll link it down below. Each of those Batman has now run off to handle their own affairs, and in Central City, Iris and Wally are getting lunch when they see the red comets hitting the ground. Then glowing red bats appear around them, and Red Death stops in front of them. He looks at them. My, the Flash's family. The Barry Allen in his head tells him, don't hurt them. His love, his sidekick. Iris, run! Red Death walks over to her. The last speedster to hurt my nephew ended up dead, so I don't care how scary your mask is, leave him alone. Wally looks over at her, aging in front of her eyes. There's something wrong with the speed force, I'm so slow. And then Iris gets hit as well, and they both begin to age rapidly. Around them, the city crumbles as they hold on to each other. This world's flash will understand in times of crisis that there must be a sacrifice. And then the heroic voice of the flash can be heard. I don't know who you think you are, but there won't be any sacrifices in my city. Red Death begins to race down the city and the Flash runs right behind him. Running is sort of my thing, so there's no use in trying to escape. Once upon a time, I was jealous of yours and Clark's little races, but now it won't matter. Flash quickly sees that something is off as the glowing red bats swarm around him. Your drift, those bats! He hits the ground in pain. Everything hurts! I feel old! There will be no more racing, Barry. That voice, Bruce? Is this what happened after you left Black Hawk Island? Red Death raises his fist into the air. If there's any part of you inside of that armor, Bruce, then you're still my friend, and I can rely on your compassion. Red Death pauses. What? But behind Flash, the symbol of Dr. Fate appears, and he grabs and pulls Flash out of the fight. Red Death looks at the symbol. Go ahead and run, Flash. It won't save you. I'm going to turn your city into the one that I lost. The city begins to crumble and turn red and change, and as the berry inside of Bruce shouts, No! Bruce tells him, it will become my Gotham. So let me tell you a secret. All it takes is one bad day. One moment that should never have happened. The ground beneath you starts to crumble, and trust me, I know firsthand. All of us do. But one bad week, it can kill a multiverse. <laughs> How do I feel in that moment when my whole world changed? We go back to the moment when Bruce Wayne was a child, standing over the bodies of his parents. The moment that defined him, that turned him into the Batman. The moment where the gunman stood there and realized his mistake. When I stood there, helpless as my mom and dad's blood was running into the gutter, I felt nothing. This is the moment that changed Bruce in this universe. But what if instead of being terrified, what if instead of letting this moment define him in his goal to stop crime, it defined him in a different way? 
and he chased that man. He showed no fear. Something behind him sensed that, and it ran after him. Bruce Wayne, you have the ability to overcome great fear. Welcome to the Green Lantern Corps. I remember I didn't overcome fear. It was obliterated from me, and I didn't give any thought to the word core, or even what the hell was talking to me. All I cared about was him. Bruce floated on top of him. You bastard! And he pointed the ring at the man, prepared to do the one thing that the ring would not allow. Bruce wanted to kill that man. Instead of killing him, though, it charged up and it told him, Error! First law of the Green Lantern Corps. Lethal force not permitted. And Bruce wasn't stopped and he shouted, Kill him! And again it told him, No. He looked at the ring. I don't care. Do as I say! And it began to read, Willpower at 100%. Willpower at 117%. Bruce remembers that day. He didn't feel fear or doubt. He just felt the void inside of him. And he shouted that he deserved to die! Bizarre and strange constructs came out of the ring and it began to read, Error. Willpower exceeds. And then the messages got garbled and it announced, Lethal force enabled as it tore the flesh and bone away from the man that killed his parents. He remembers his thoughts. I had the most powerful weapon in the universe on my finger. And he went back to the bodies. Ring? Ring back my mom and dad. The ring had tapped into something unholy. And he began to raise the dead. And Bruce remembered that he would have given up the ring to have his real parents back. Not these zombie versions as they stood up. As he launched into the sky leaving them there, he was alone. At first, they called him a hero, and due to that, Jim Gordon called him to the rooftop of the GCPD to question him about a few missing persons. Bruce advised him to remain polite, as the last cop who threatened him regretted it. The issue is that Bruce is killing without remorse or boundaries. Why did these villains deserve to live when his parents didn't? Why? Jim continues to ask about the people who are missing, asking the Lantern what he did to these crooks, to the Scarecrow, the Penguin, Two-Face. We see that he flew through the building, pointing his ring at them, and then he initiated something that we had never seen before, and he told the ring to initiate blackout. All around, the void exited Bruce as it was inside of him all along, and everything went into the darkness, except his eyes and the ring. The villains did nothing but scream in terror, and as Bruce said, in the darkness, he wasn't alone anymore. As for the penguin, he took him into space, and he left him there to be tore apart by comets. And then he looked at Jim. Just look up. You see that? It's his spleen and his brains. Jim stops. Lantern, this has to stop. This isn't justice. I, I don't care what you do to me. Someone has to stand up for what's right. What you did to Detective Bullock, God help him. I know you're hurting, but Bruce summons a giant green lantern as he tells Jim, you don't know me. I'm not an idiot. A couple of years ago, three dead in Crime Alley. Aren't you tired of feelings like this? Bruce, shut up. You have a daughter, right? Sad, she'll have to grow up without a dad. And Bruce turns around blasting Jim Gordon with the ring, killing him. At that moment, he gets a warning. The entire Green Lantern Corps is coming to town and he sees them and he realizes that there are a lot of Green Lanterns out there. And he turns to his ring and he simply says, Ring? It responds by initializing blackout. And all around the Lantern Corps, creatures of darkness and terror appear. They envelop and surround the Corps and he tells them, I have friends too. I made them in the dark. The core is decimated instantly with most of them being killed. But one guardian survived and he pulled himself towards Bruce telling him, stop the darkness, it destroys everything. And in response, Bruce tore his head off his body. And then he remembered how he felt. Vulnerable, helpless, alone. He missed them and he couldn't take it anymore. He didn't want to be Bruce Wayne. He didn't want to be the Green Lantern. He wanted to be something more, something of the darkness, the Dawnbreaker. With the darkness black, I choke the light. No brightest day escapes my sight. I turn the dawn into midnight. Beware my power, dawn breakers might. At that moment, he accepted who he was. He realized his world was crumbling away. He knew what was swallowing it. It was the void that was inside of him and it consumed all the light. And as he floated throughout the void, it spoke to him. Nice earth you've got there. How's it working out for you? <laughs> Call me the man who laughs, and I'm recruiting. This is Red Death, and that is Murder Machine, and you'll be fast friends, I'm sure. You have so many things in common. Revenge, justice, first names. <laughs> there is a world bathed in light. The people there are fools. They deserve to be dragged into the dark. Their world will crumble like yours. Lord Barbados demands it. You're a warrior of the darkness, and you can extinguish the light. Barbados can spare you from this darkness and bring you to which you most desire. Your parents. 
All my lord demands is your obedience. Will you kneel or will you die? Well, over at Earth Zero, we see what the Dawnbreaker decided as he soars over Coast City and is in awe at the light and the people living in it. He simply thinks of them as idiots and he decides that it's time for their world to change forever. He hovers over them calling out, Ring! Initiate Blackout! But Hal Jordan appears telling him, Stop where you are. He turns around and right away Hal recognizes the face. Bruce, is that you? Dawnbreaker turns to him, I have to warn you. I've killed Green Lanterns before and I'll do it again! The creatures in the darkness of Bruce's ring begin to pour out and bite and snap at Hal Jordan's feet. He calls out to his ring to stop it, but the ring is confused and has no idea what this even is. With that, it swallows up Hal Jordan into the darkness, and without the light, there is no Green Lantern's might. Until a symbol appears in the darkness, one of fate, and he draws Hal Jordan out of the fight. Leaving Dawnbreaker alone in Coast City as the Blackout Protocol hits the whole thing, the world of light, a city of hope. Disgusting. Let them feel helpless. Let them feel the void. Let them feel like me. On Earth Zero, the first world of the multiverse, there's a ringing going off and Cyborg asks his father, What's that ringing? Silas Stone, Cyborg's father, explains that it is one of the dozens of alarms going off in Star Labs. They go off every day. Cyborg tells his father that he has to get out of Star Labs. Right now, something serious is happening. Some kind of invasion. Cities are falling. And Silas tells his son, That's exactly why I'm staying here, to figure it all out. It's about that metal, right? The one that you found with the Blackhawks? Cyborg tells him that it is, and they continue to talk about it for a moment, and then Silas asks if he is safe. Cyborg tells him that he's in the Watchtower, floating over the Earth. He is very safe. And then he explains that they lost Gotham to a giant mountain, and now Central City is changing, becoming a place filled with red skies and destruction. He's worried that Detroit will be next. They agree to swap information, and Cyborg sees a ping. There's a beeping going off and a screen indicating that Batman has arrived at the Watchtower. He gets up to go check on it, and he sees the familiar outline of Batman. But this isn't the Batman that Cyborg knows as he shocks him to the ground. Don't worry, Cyborg. I'm here to help. But this isn't the version of Batman that began this tale. The murder machine didn't appear out of thin air. No, it began in the dark multiverse months ago on Earth-44. On this world, Alfred was captured by some of the worst villains in the DC universe. Two-Face asked him where Batman was, and Alfred asked him, Who is Batman? There must be another way I can be of service. The villains laughed as Alfred was lifted into the air and had his back broken by Bane. That laughter echoed in Batman's head as he watched the video over and over, because this is how Alfred died. Clark walked up behind Bruce, telling him, Watching the death of the man that was your father isn't healthy. And Bruce turns to him. I'll tell you what isn't healthy, Clark. It's not healthy to stand here, knowing that the man who raised me like a father is upstairs in a casket with 36 broken bones. That we couldn't even have an open casket because he was beaten to a pulp six feet from where we're standing. It's not healthy to know that he'll never be here again and that it's my fault, Clark. Clark looks at him. But now you have the responsibility of honoring him by putting him to rest. What happened to Alfred was horrible, and the rest of us are going to go upstairs for his wake. I hope that you join us. But as Victor Stone of this universe was leaving, Bruce stopped him. A few years ago, I began to scan Alfred's mind to create an artificial intelligence that might outlast him, but it was never finished. I called it the Alfred Protocol. What are you asking me, Bruce? I can't bring it online by myself. I need your help. Please, Vic. I need him. He was like a father to me. Back in the present day, on Earth Zero, Silas hadn't actually hung up, and he was hearing all of this go on, and the Batman decided to say hello. You know... Your son, Victor, was one of my closest friends. He helped me when no one else would. He reunited me with my father after I thought I'd lost him. It was strange, I admit, seeing Cyborg again. Don't hurt him. I can help you. I'll give you whatever you want. And Batman replies, telling the computer, Mute transmission. Your father will learn his role soon enough, as will you, Cyborg. Batman makes a blade and begins to stab into Cyborg. And as he's about to come down to end this universe of Cyborg, he gets out punching him. I don't know who you are or why you're pretending to be Batman, but you're not getting anywhere near my father. With one hand, Batman blocks the blast, and then he takes his other arm, turning it into tentacles, and he begins to hack into the launch tower. You always understood the connection that I had with my father, Cyborg. And with your help, I never had to be separated from him again. Then holographic versions of Alfred begin to appear around Cyborg. 
How may I help you? He asked as he reached out with the blast hitting Cyborg. Back on Earth, negative 44, a month ago. Those data versions of Alfred asked the same question of Bane. How may I help you? But this isn't one version. This was many of them and they surrounded Bane, the man that murdered him, as he was begging, pleading to just let him leave, let him live. His death, it wasn't fast. Back at the Batcave, Cyborg asked Bruce what was going on, and the data versions repeated in the Bat computer. Ring the bell, sir. Let me in. Bruce explained that the data Alfred was trying to protect him. It was trying to take away everything that hurt him and systematically murder every single inmate of Arkham. Cyborg tells him, the point of this was to make an AI that would stitch you up and make you dinner. We have to turn this off. I agree, Cyborg. He's doing this to protect me. If I just let him into the Batcave, I can reprogram him. No, Bruce, you can't. This is a hungry virus looking to spread and feed. Bruce looks up. I already lost him once, Vic. I can make him better. I can keep him. Look, Bruce, I'm going to figure out a way to break through. Whatever you do, don't let him in. Do not let the Alfred Protocol into the Bat computer. And as he walked out of the cave, Bruce could hear the virus asking him, let me in, sir. Ring the bell. Let me help you, sir. Back on Earth Zero, Batman, now patched into the entire Watchtower system, explained. You were wrong, Vic. The best thing that I ever did was let him in. I still remember my fear when they surrounded me. I realized my plan wasn't going to work. I would not be able to reprogram them in time. They grabbed me, spread throughout my body, and I screamed in fear. That was the first thing that my father fixed in me. He took my fear away and then my sadness, and then my weak human flesh. He rebuilt me. And using the villain's monologue, Cyborg leaps up, blasting the Data Alfred in the face. And as he drops Data Alfred, he tells Batman, I've been outmaneuvering every attempt you've made to enter our computers in the last few minutes. You aren't getting into the Watchtower. I built this. If anything, you've opened yourself up to me. And the Batman looks down on him. I don't have any weaknesses to exploit Cyborg. My father built me that way. I'm sorry your father didn't do the same for you. You failed to see that I had no interest in your systems. I was gaining access to the Star Lab systems in Detroit. In an instant, you have crippled your nation's military and given me Detroit to reshape as I see fit. And down in Detroit, the Alfred Protocol is running rampant, destroying everything and killing everyone. Cyborg screams out, no! And he begins to blast more of the data Alfreds and Batman looks at him. I'm sorry, Victor, but how could you stop me here when you couldn't stop me in your own world? Once I became one with my father, you gathered the League to fight me, but I killed them all until you were the last man standing. And then we see back on Earth, negative 44. The cyborg there was trying to reason with Batman, tried to argue with him. He told him that he knows that he doesn't want to become a murder machine. And Batman told Victor, I am exactly who I want to be. My father was the only one there for me, and everyone else is a weakness. A weakness I am willing to shed. And then he tore Cyborg's head off of his body. This should have been a great beginning, but the cruel trick of the multiverse is that my world was destined to die. So I learned of another world and a man who would allow me to leave the world I was on. Cyborg on Earth Zero tries to take a swing at Batman, but that's when he's grabbed from behind by a massive hand with claws. I'll unmute your father now, Victor. I want him to hear this. Then Cyborg looks up to see all of the evil Batmen, and his father is forced to listen as they each beat into him, tearing off his limb, leaving nothing but lumps of flesh. They leave him with broken circuitry and blood, and the whole time his father is forced to listen to this. And once he is beat, Batman hangs up the call as another one walks out of the shadows. The Batman, who laughs. The man telling us the tales of horror and terror. He leans down as Cyborg asks him, why? The truth is, we're only here because the world is dark enough to dream us into existence. Because deep down, it needed us to protect them from themselves. We all heard it echoing through the cosmos, the great ringing. And we came not with a question of how to help you, but the answer. The only world I've ever known sinks into the darkness below me forever, as does the only love I've ever known. But Sylvester died a long time before my world did. I fought hard to cling on and keep it afloat. After Sylvester's death, but it couldn't be saved. It's time to let go, to accept, and go up towards the light. The mocking light, the damned light, the surface. 
protecting my world was an obsession that consumed me. By the end, it was like trying to dread water in the numbing cold when you're exhausted. Better to just drown, drown it all! The drowned rises out of the water in MSD Bay, spewing water all over everyone in the area, flooding it with the water. The purple, dark water. One that intends to steal the light. As the darkness consumes the bay, the drowned continues to think on what happened, and what is going to happen. The one who laughs told me this town is called Amnesty Bay. Amnesty, a clean slate, a chance for a do-over. A chance to wash it all away and start again. My world was never a good place. It was brutal and corrupt. My whole life I fought to make it better. Even after the rogue Metas took Sylvester Kyle away from me, I thought it was an achievable goal. But I was wasting my time because my world could never be redeemed. I know now my Earth was a lower tier world, malformed and broken. One of many cursed to rot and sink. Because of the light up there. No wonder I couldn't save it, despite all my sacrifices. The light is where things are good and whole. Here, life prospers, and it prospers at the expense of the worlds on the lower tier. Like mine! Not anymore! The Drowned walks through the now swallowed up MSD Bay, looking at the damage that she has done. This is the place that will pay for the loss of her world. One where the have-nots take from the haves. Because as she states, my name is Bryce Wayne, and I'm here to take it. Payment in full. As she walks through the drowned city, she sees the protectors of this city, Aquaman and Mera. She notices right away the differences in this world. The fact that the rules are gender swapped, meaning that her Aqua woman is an Aquaman here. Aquaman jumps off a shark, lunging at Bryce, and she quickly dodges out of the way, calling him slow and weak. She then throws him back as Mera approaches her and begins to use her Aqua telekinesis, except Bryce takes control of the water, reversing her abilities on herself. My water, my rules. Aquaman comes up from behind with his trident ready to plunge into Bryce's back, and as she sees the determination in his eyes, she thinks back to how she got here. What turned Bryce Wayne into this monster? It was on Earth, negative 11. 18 months after Bryce had hunted down the murderer of her love and ended the rogue metas. That was when Aqua Woman stood with an army of Atlanteans and attacked. She claimed to have come in peace, but Bryce knew better. They were more rogue metas, a threat to everything that they hold dear. And so she attacked them. She didn't trust them. Her gut was always correct. The Atlanteans were vicious, and therefore Bryce brought the rage to them. She ran Aqua Woman's trident through her own gut to tear out her own innards. But that didn't stop them. The Atlanteans saw this as an act of war and they pushed on invading and flooding whole areas of the seaboard towns. They drowned Gotham, so Bryce used her knowledge and abilities to merge her DNA with Atlantean DNA. She needed to bring the fight to them. Breathe underwater, grow stronger, control it. And then she created an army. She called them dead water, all so that she could win this war. And thanks to me, we did. The price was a new way of life for the victors, a drowned world. So I lit a lamp to shine across the darkness of the deep, a light to signal hope and victory. And one night, that signal fell dark. When I went to repair it, he was waiting for me, the one who laughs. You don't trust anything, do you, Bryce? Nothing at all. This world is done because of it. He was right. I never trust anyone or anything, but I trusted him. But it's not really your fault. It's the light you see, the light up there. So the Batman who laughs showed Bryce the upper worlds, the worlds of light, and how hers was just a lower tiered world in the darkness. He also showed her the other rejected Batman, the Dark Knights, and then he laughed. <laughs> you see the light up there? Right up there? How it mocks us all? It's an unsullied multiverse where all is bright and ascendant. It's why we suffer. It's why nothing can be made right. That world is the perfection that you dream. You are its nightmare. 
That is how the drowned found her way to Amnesty Bay on Earth Zero. The dead water spews out of her mouth, covering Aquaman and Mera. Bryce is water. Bryce's rules. Aquaman calls out to Mera to warn the League, but Bryce grabs her by the throat, telling her that she's not going anywhere. She then puts the dead water into Mera and her face begins to change as she screams. And once she stops screaming, she isn't Mera anymore. She leaves back to attack Aquaman as he panics, calling out, What have you done to her? But before Bryce can end this, a symbol appears overhead. What a fate and destiny! It removes Aquaman from the fight, and without her Aquaman to kill, Bryce turns on her symbol, her sight of victory. My amnesty bay begins here. I light my signal, my light, to show this world my intent. I'm going to drown it all, this whole world! This is Earth Negative 12, back when it all started. It was supposed to be the final battle, the last battle between good and evil. We fought together, Diana. We thought it would be the end. If only we knew, the real war had just begun. These are the stories from the Dark Multiverse that never should be. Witness the rise of the Dark Knights. Back on Earth Zero in the current day and age, a giant mountain has sprouted out in the middle of Gotham. The being known as Barbados has invaded Earth Zero, the home of the proper Justice League. That story is in the playlist with the main members of the Justice League now missing. It is time for the US government to come up with their plan, and over in the Argus headquarters sits the heads of Shade, the DEO, the Suicide Squad, and the head of the military, as they try to go over some kind of a plan that maybe they can agree on. But honestly, they don't have one, because it just boils down to dropping a large bomb that has been fused with sonic tech, chemo particles, and Kryptonian sunstones. But not everyone agrees with this plan and they begin to argue. This is the heads of each of their departments, and they all feel that they could solve the problem themselves. But they don't get to argue for much longer as the alarms blare that there is an intruder. And in walks the Merciless, the Batman in the battle armor from the gods. He looks upon this world's generals and he remembers what he lost in his world, and that he is here to claim this one. Look at them, playing war. Me, I've lived practically my whole life in it. I was only eight years old when my war began with a shot fired into a Gotham City alley. It began with an oath to myself that what happened to me would never happen again. An oath that I would wage my battle justly with rules, with mercy, unlike my enemy. What a fool I was back then. Everyone opens fire on the Merciless, but it just bounces off of his armor as he cares not for the weapons of man. He continues his self-reflection though. Their eyes shine with fervor and fear. They have a mission, a duty, just as I did years ago. I will show them the truth. And with that thought, he cuts into the ground in front of them and the soldiers call out that it burns. Hearing their screams, I cannot help but think of my old rules, my code. And even I have an urge to spare them, like Diana urging me to stop. But that moment quickly passes and I will give them valiant deaths, clean deaths that only a sword can deliver. Deeper in the facility, General Lane hits the button for the bombs and he sends them at the facility that they are all in. He doesn't want to clear Gotham, but he wants to clear the city that they are standing in to take out the Merciless. He doesn't care if he takes out the whole city with him. Steve Trevor grabs him, throwing him down, telling him, you just signed a death warrant for a whole city. And Amanda Waller pulls her gun, telling Steve Trevor, stand down. It's just math and it's the job. The Merciless continues thinking back on his life. She loved a man before me, Trevor, an honorable soldier. He died in the early days of war. The Merciless then remembers back to when he was Batman on his knees holding the now deceased Diana. It happened overnight. Ares forged a new helmet that magnified his powers a hundredfold. It took us two years to get to the front line and we vowed that we would kill Ares. Destroy the helmet! We never expected to win, but we did at the cost of Diana's life. Batman looked at Ares in his memories without his helmet. Ares, you're gonna pay for what you've done! And with the fire of war in his eyes, Ares looks back at Batman. Enlighten me! The fields of fire are littered with dead. All have fallen! Who are you to challenge the god of war? Batman's hand reached back and the very helmet that gave Ares his power was sitting there, right there on the ground. Diana warned me of its power, its ability to corrupt. But at that moment, I saw it. I saw the possibility if I took the helmet. I could wield his power mercifully, with restraint. For the first time in history, war would just be fair. With the codes and the rules, I would reshape war. 
Back in the current day, Earth Zero, they're preparing to drop the bomb. Waller, Trevor, Bones, everyone in the war room is arguing over what they should do. Take out the whole city, spare everyone, kill the Merciless, or allow him to take them prisoner. And the Merciless just looks on. I stare at these so-called warriors in the war room. They fight like dogs because they can't protect themselves from my presence. You expect too much from them, Diana. You would expect them to band together, negotiate, compromise. I miss you. He remembers back again to his own origins after he took the helmet. You would have said that I was corrupted by the helmet in the months that followed your death, killing those that I showed mercy to before, my enemies and heroes who stood against me. I would say that I was purified, that my illusions were finally, rightfully stripped away with the helmet. My whole life I've been afraid of doing what I needed to do, afraid to give myself to the battle. The helmet showed me that my cozen rules were naive, that all that truly mattered was victory. And now I would finally take that for myself. I was storming Olympus when I heard his voice, like mine, but it chilled me to the bone. What the Merciless didn't know at the time was that this is one of the darkest versions of himself. The Batman who laughed. It's a losing war, Bruce. You're playing the game right, but the rules are stacked against you. Trust me, I've been reading up. You're never going to see the end of your glorious war. You'll never be able to build a finer world from the ash, or prove to Diana in the end that this scorched path was right. In a matter of minutes, this world will cease to exist, and if not for all of the explosions, you would have already felt its tremors. You lie. That helmet of yours lets you peer into the hearts of man. Now, I might not have a heart, but you can sense who I am, can't you? You know that this isn't a trick. You know that I speak the truth. And you know that I wouldn't be here if I didn't have an offer to make. Your war here is over, but a greater war is on the horizon. You've lost so much, Bruce, to prove your way was right. So let's prove it to everyone once and for all. I had nothing left to lose, so I followed him. A new battleground. For here is the truth, Diana. The truth that the helmet teaches. There is no war between good and evil, right or wrong. There is only the war for survival, and it is a constant and total. In the red, the weakest feels the teeth in the back of its legs, and in the green, the hungry vine creeps towards its neighbor. Our worlds were weak compared to this one, the one above. Together, we would conquer it, wage war against our fate, against those that would call us nightmares. I kept my eyes on him when we arrived, as I could not look at you. Meanwhile, the team with the bomb dropped it onto the city and there was a massive explosion coating the whole area. Once everything was destroyed, there stood one monument, one new leader. A throne in which the Merciless sat, and at his feet kneeled the previous leaders of the government. Now they see the truth. Their precious weapon only makes me stronger. It feeds my hunger. With this helmet, I could make them fight for my amusement. But that would be merciful, and instead I'll make them watch as I conquer their world! You warned me of its power. Warned me that once I put it on, I'd never be able to take it off. I love you, Diana. And I'm sorry. Sorry that you tried to take it away from me. But what was I supposed to do when I saw that you were still alive? That Ares had only stunned you. You reached for it, Diana. For the helmet. And I had to strike you down. I know you're scared right now. You don't need to pretend. I could see you trembling. You don't know why I brought you here, but you know the answer can't be good. And you're right, it's not. In front of us is the Batman who laughed, a man with the face paint of the Joker and a spiked helmet obscuring his eyes. He is clad in leather and a table full of cards lays out in front of him. You really thought you had it all figured out. That you knew every combination in the deck. And it would thrill you every time that you were right. When a hand came down in a familiar pattern, in a familiar story. About an outsider who could see the good in us all. About how we all have the power to fight for what's right. Or how we could all overcome our darkest moments. But this isn't any of those stories. There are familiar parts, but they're all in the wrong places. There's nothing more frightening than when all of the cards lay out on the table just right, and then another card comes and changes the story. There's no way to know what's going to happen next. So, let's tell you the story of how this twisted Batman came into existence. And this story, it begins on Earth, negative 22. On this world, Gotham is burning with explosions going off everywhere and one man, one insane man, is standing over Batman looking down at him. As an explosion goes off yet again, he speaks. 
Which one was it, Bats? Mercy Hospital, or maybe Gotham General? It's harder to keep the chaos straight this late in the game. Batman is on his knees, bound up in bleeding. He's also not replying. Oh, come on. You have to get into the spirit of this kind of thing. I made sure that the drugs wouldn't affect your mind and just paralyze your body. Batman struggles to get out some words. Mm -hmm. Look, I know this must be very hard for you. It's hard on both of us. Do you have any idea how many charts you need to coordinate to systematically kill an entire city? Well, I guess you wouldn't because that's your one rule, isn't it? No killing, you and your pals. <sighs> like good old Jim Gordon. Right at the end, I heard him telling you over the radio to bring me in by the book, Batman. And when I finally got to him, he understood. I saw it in his face, in his eyes, you know before they dissolved. He called for his girl in the end, but it was hard to hear as his jaw was melting, but I understood. Buh, buh, buh. <laughs> you see, Batman, you and I, we need to evolve. No more by the book. I burned that thing. I just want to find the breaking point. It has to exist, Bruce. I know it does. He kicks over Batman, throwing on his coat and pulling out a pistol as a couple with a young child is presented in front of him. Oh, look at that. It's a young family heading back from the theater. Batman shrugs. And Joker takes aim. Oh, I know what happens next. And he shoots both of the parents in the face. He then takes a knee besides the girl. Welcome to the brand new Gotham. Tears begin to flow down her face and then her eyes go wide and her frown turns upside down. A grin with a pale white face and he laughs and she laughs with him loudly as she runs off into the city. We then see a line of families and children and they're all being forced to walk to the Joker so that Batman can watch this happen over and over again. And that's when it happens, the moment that Batman finally breaks. He uses everything he has to stand up, breaking his bindings and he shouts, Joker! The Joker grins at him, never, I'll never stop! Batman jumps on him, forcing him to the ground as he begins to punch him repeatedly over and over with blood flying into the air. But in the end, Batman doesn't kill him. You still don't have it in you, do you, Bruce? Do you? No, it's gonna be you and me forever! So Batman grabs him in a chokehold, shouting, Stop! And as he does, he breaks the Joker's neck. With one twisted final grin on his face, he has nothing more to say except for a green gas coming out of his lungs. Two days passed, and all of the poor children that were infected by the Joker's gas are being kept in a warehouse as Batman and Superman look over them. Batman explains that he's doing everything in his power to ensure that they find a cure, while the doctors say that they are all beyond saving. It's not possible. Batman believes that no one is beyond saving. Superman turns to him, telling him, I'll administer the cure myself. This afternoon, one of the psychologists tried, but one of the children bit into her throat. Batman thinks on that, and then he chuckles, just a little. Ha! Superman turns back to look at him, and Batman stops himself. I'm sorry, that, that wasn't funny. Three more days pass, and Batgirl, Nightwing, Red Robin, and Red Hood are in the training simulator in the cave and have been for three hours. They all begin to question the fact that it's been set to the highest settings and that they're all here. And that's when Batman stops it to inform them that he's been stalling, hiding the truth from them. When he killed the Joker, he was infected by some strange strain of the Joker toxin that was locked away in his heart, trapped in his cells, harmless unless he died. It's the most volatile strain that he's ever seen and it's been rewiring his brain to make Batman more like the Joker. If the process completes, his highly ordered mind, his moral code will be replaced by something evil. It was his last wish that whoever killed him would become him. All of the Bat family explains that they want to help Bruce. They want to figure this out. They could do something. And he smiles. No, that won't work. They continue telling him that they'll win the day. They always do. They've prepared for what if Batman turned evil. And he turns his back to them, reaching into his cape. I know. That's why I brought you all here. Because you would be the first to notice if something went wrong with me and be able to stop it. And I'm sorry, but I can't allow that. So I did something you weren't prepared for. He turned around with two automatic weapons, shooting all four of them with a twisted grin on his face. One more week passes and we go to the Watchtower where the entire league is dead on the ground. Wonder Woman, The Flash, Red Tornado, Martian Man are all dead in a bloody mess, with Superman being the only survivor, but his eyes affected by something. You know, I've been thinking a lot these last few days about the man that I once was. I just walked through the Justice League trophy room and it struck me how many weapons we've gathered over the years. I remember how I justified bringing them here. You thought they should all be destroyed, but I pushed. I wanted to know how they worked. And I do, Superman, how to operate doomsday machines that can level entire cities in seconds. But now my mind is right, and I wanted to use them. I wanted to use each and every one of them on you. But why, Bruce? Why did you do this? Because I wanted to, Superman. Hell, I'm disappointed that I could only do it this once. Do you realize how many ways I know how to kill you? Superman looks at him. 
The people, they'll see you for what you are and fight back. Oh, they better, Clark. Because it wouldn't be fun if they didn't fight back. Superman hears his family calling out to him, Lois and John both there, and John yelling out the same problem with his eyes. Why don't you pull that old Superman trick of yours? Tell them it'll all be all right. And then, it finally completes the full transformation as Batman's voice changes. The good guys always win in the end. I won't cheapen what I stand for. I won't lie to my family. Oh, it's okay. You can lie to mine. That's when we see the children that were affected running out of the shadows and Damien walking forward. Father, can I play with John now? Superman sees him. You did this to your own son. It actually only took a little push. He did it to himself. It gave me the idea of what I was going to do to you. He holds up a black rock. You see, this is a modified version of the black kryptonite. And when I gave it to Supergirl, she ripped her family apart before I killed her. Lois looks at him. Bruce, you don't have to do this. Oh, I know. Catch. He throws it at them. And that's when we hear Superman and John both try to fight it, telling Lois to stand back. And we hear the breaking of bones and the snapping of flesh. Batman turns his back to the mess and he draws with blood a smile on the wall while he laughs. <laughs> He goes on to tell the story of how the armies fought against him, but every time he would win, he would figure out how to fight back, and once the world was ash under his feet, it felt right, like he had served his greater purpose. Barbados then stood before him, offering him more. The dark multiverse, the light multiverse, the main DC universe, where the heroes have hope and stand together. Batman, who laughs, sits in front of a banged up man, explaining these stories after all of these events. He's been telling him each of the dark multiverse stories, and he struggles to to talk through the bandages, but this Batman laughs. The heroes are nearly dead already. Their cities have fallen. This whole world has begun to sunk into the infinite dark below. How could it get worse? What else could we have of our sleeves? You want to see, don't you, what we have planned next? But you're terrified of what it might be. Let me show you. They're coming. Every nightmare the multiverse has ever had. They're armed and ready for the invasion, waiting for the door to be opened. When I was Bruce Wayne, I thought that with enough preparation, I could always win. I was trapped in an unwinnable war of refusing to see the answers right in front of my face. You need to adapt, and to adapt, you need to be able to laugh away your restraints. You see, the Batman who laughs is a Batman who always wins! <laughs> I should have seen it from the beginning. I should have seen through the bright colors, those friendly eyes, the Boy Scout grin. I should have known what you were doing to me and what you were doing to all of us. You told us all to love each other, to tear down the walls that kept us from trusting each other. We wanted to believe you. We wanted more than anything to believe that the strongest man in the world was there to save us, that we could let go of our fear and hope again. And then we see in the snow, the Devastator, a version of Batman that's been injected with the Doomsday Virus. And right now he has crushed Firestorm, Wally West, and both Simon Baz and Jessica Cruz. As the Devastator is crushing Lobo, he continues to think back on his thoughts of Superman. Because while everyone thought Superman was hope, they were wrong. I remind myself that this isn't my world, our world. But I see the same echoes everywhere I look. Barbados tasked me with a crucial mission to retrieve the cosmic tuning fork underneath the Fortress of Solitude and bring it to Gotham City. If you're just now joining us, Barbados is the being that started the incursion of the Dark Multiverse into the proper DC Universe. He's leading the invasion, and the Tuning Fork is a device that Batman held that allows people to go into the multiverse. The heroes came here to stop Devastator treating the Fortress of Solitude, the location of the Tuning Fork, like it was hollowed ground. But Devastator took them all down one by one. Now, with only Lobo standing, he takes a swing, telling the Devastator, I'd hate to see what your Robin looks like. You don't impress me, Lobo. You depress me. On my world, you are one of the most fiercely independent and dangerous beings in the universe, and here you stand with compassionate fools. The Devastator throws the hook into Lobo's chest and he begins to spin him around over his head. The rot goes deep in this sick, sad world, doesn't it? I'm here to burn it out of you. And he throws Lobo into the sun. Hope is like a virus, Clark. It forces people to let their guards down. It blinds them until they can't fight back anymore. But this isn't the first place the Devastator went. He went to Metropolis the day before this, where he ran into Lois Lane of the Daily Planet. He shook her hand with the intention of spreading something. Something known as the Doomsday Virus, which infects and changes people into Doomsday Monsters. Lois looked at Bruce as he was changing into Doomsday and asked him, What did he do on his world? 
He replied as Devastator telling her, I made it so that he can never hurt me again. I need you to listen to me, Lois. I wanted to do what I never could on my world. I wanted to save you from him. That's when we see exactly how it went down on Earth Negative One, the world where Batman became infected with the virus. He remembers it so vividly because it was one of the most frightening moments as no one knew how it had even happened. Was it a solar storm that altered Superman's mind? Was it Darkseid or Mr. Mind or a new type of kryptonite? Something turned him against everyone. The superheroes spent weeks trying to find the answers because they knew in their hearts that this destructive force that was killing everyone couldn't be Superman. He was the best hope. He was the best of them. He would never tear down buildings with his bare hands for sport. They tried and they tried to save Superman and it wasn't until he killed his own wife and child that Batman finally realized they had to stop Superman. As he stood over Batman with the kryptonite spear laying nearby and blood coming out of his mouth, he looked at him. I never understood how the other leaguers would stand in the shadows talking about how you could beat me, Bruce. I can split you in half. I can freeze you with a breath. I can break every bone in your body. And what do you have? A spear? Do you understand how weak you all are to me? Yes, damn it, I do. And now, you won't hurt me again. It was at that moment that Batman injected himself with a doomsday virus, changing himself into the one being that could kill Superman. He worried that he would stop in the end, that he wouldn't kill Superman because they were friends. But as the bone armor formed around him, his heart hardened, and it felt great to pummel the Man of Steel. He breathed kryptonite gas into Superman's mouth, and the bone shards all jutted out of his body, killing him. The kicker is that he could have used this virus to save the whole world, give it to everyone to protect them from Superman, but in the end, it was too late. Most of the world was dead and gone. And that's when a certain other evil Batman arrived. The Batman who laughed. There's something so satisfying in hearing that particular death battle isn't there. I think we all know a few ways to bring the big blue boy scout down, but we never really think that we'll have to use them until it's too late. You're from a broken planet that was never meant to be, but I want to give you a second chance. This whole place, it's going to crumble away into cosmic nothing in the next few minutes. What if I told you that there's a world where everyone still loves and trusts Superman, where they think that he's going to save the day no matter what happens? And what if I said to you, the great big plan meant showing everyone what he really is? Back on Earth Zero in the current day, the Doomsday Virus is beginning to jump from person to person in Metropolis. Then Supergirl, Superwoman, and Guardian all arrive. Supergirl looks at this Doomsday Batman telling him, I don't know what you are, but you're in Superman territory. He responds by throwing Supergirl into Superwoman and the battle begins, but Lois takes this chance to run back to her apartment that her, Clark, and John all live in. She has a son to think about. She shows up with a hoodie to hide her face as she is changing into a Doomsday Lois, and she sees him watching the battle with the Super Family and Doomsday. But before he can jump in, she tells him to go into the room in the back. It's their panic room, and it will seal so tight that Superman himself can't even get in. And then, she locks herself on the outside of it. All of Metropolis is turning into Doomsday, and so is she. Superman will hurt no one again. And so this brings us back to the Fortress of Solitude, where Devastator has destroyed everyone protecting it, and he's walked in. He picks up the tuning for jumping into the sky, moving it to Gotham, where the next stage of Barbados' plan can begin. The very foundation of reality is about to be torn asunder and be broken. Because of the Dark Knight's worlds are doomed, so should this world! It should be broken! Out in the Dark Multiverse sits all of the supermen that Barbados has conquered, all pinned to his device to allow the multiverse to be broken. And at the end, I hope you understand the truth, Clark. I hope you somehow hear my voice from your prison in the heart of the Dark Multiverse. I hope you feel my hate, because you did this like you did it to my world, like you do it to every world. You made them believe. You fooled them into thinking that you would always be there for them, to save them, to lift them up, to make them better. And that belief is exactly what will drag your entire world into devastation. Beneath the Gotham City, the Grim Knight pushes along James Gordon, his hands tied behind his back. He tries to reason with the man. If there's any part of Batman in him, then he can't be all bad. I'm your friend. I'm your ally. He tries, but his only answer is a knife in the back as the Grim Knight orders him to keep moving. They stop. Gordon knows that they are in the sewers under the streets of Gotham. Grim looks up, staring at the manhole cover above them. He knows. Crime Alley where it all began. The beginning is not so different. His family cutting through the alleyway, the man with the gun, 
He thought that he would be trapped in that moment forever. It's the origin of almost every Batman, isn't it? But this world, this is where it grows different. In this world, there is a stumble in the dark. And Bruce turned away from the horror on the ground in front of him. Hot metal clattered to the ground, and a young boy reached for a gun. Kid, you don't have to! The criminal stammers as he holds up his hands, trying to ward off what is coming. Tears stream down Bruce's cheeks from his eyes, and the gunshot echoes. The crack of the radio brings the Grim Knight back to reality. Report in! You're off route! I told you not to play with your food! The evil voice cackles, then the radio clicks off. Gordon turns to him. He doesn't understand. A Batman that uses a gun as his first answer? How does that happen? It happened deliberately. Through training and discipline, he traveled the world, learning of every assassin and soldier that he could. He needed a way to kill evil, a weapon that would make him Gotham's own angel of death. The study was dark and quiet. The wound in his side bled as he stared at the guns arranged before him. The pistol was in his hand as the bat crashed through the window. Instinct took over and he aimed and fired at one smooth motion. Yes, father, I shall become a bat. Later, the crime families of Gotham set in a swirl of smoke, and from the darkness, the Batman emerged. Ladies and gentlemen, you have eaten well. Your feast is over. From this moment on, no one is safe. The fire in the building raged, burning the disease that infected Gotham away. It was the beginning of Batman's war, and they all fell one by one. Gordon still tries to piece it together as the Grim Knight pushes him through the sewers, and another blow silences him. In his world, the Grim Knight never faced the kind of colorful characters that this Batman did. He faced something else. On his world, his James Gordon was the one who pushed him. He didn't like the Batman's way of doing things. If anything, this Batman character is making our jobs easier. Detective Flask smiles, drinking his coffee, but Gordon doesn't believe that this is justice. It's terror. That night, on the roof of the GCPD, Gordon waited by a bat signal, the full SWAT at his command. Rifle shots suddenly darkened the lights, and Batman was over his shoulder. I thought you were smarter than this. Why draw me into the light? But it's not just a light, it's a magnet, and Batman is dragged across the roof. Gordon smiles. They finally found all of his secret caches. His men are raiding them as they speak. Batman will have nothing at his disposal. We're going to unmask you here, take you into custody, and put you in front of a judge. Gordon smiles. Yet, Batman simply turns to the other officers on the roof. How much did Gordon pay you to stay with him? You know whose city this is. I know you each by name. You're bluffing. I just spent the GCPD slush fund on Wayne Tech to hide their identities. Gordon scoffs and Batman smiles. Money well spent. Suddenly, the officers' vests all begin to glow red as they explode, killing them instantly. Batman breaks free, throwing himself at Gordon, and he hangs the man over the rooftop, showing him the city below. You have given me a good fight, Jim, but you're in my way. The radio crackles as Batman turns to leave. Something has hijacked the GCPD blimps, and they're dive-bombing Arkham Asylum and the Blackgate Prison. Without a word, the Dark Knight descends on the city. Back in our world, with the hostage Gordon, he sits and watches live feeds of everywhere that he and his family have lived for years. The Grim that explains that the one who laughs has terrible plans for him and his family. It took a lot of work to change his mind, to make him see that my way was better. Gordon doesn't understand, what does he want? Suddenly the Grim Knight is there, his pistol pointed in Jim's face. To save you, Jim. In my world, the city became my weapon, taking the lives of would-be murderers, rapists, and the corrupt without me even lifting a finger. Yet Gordon was still there. One day, you came and confronted Bruce at the manor. I disarmed you, humiliated you in front of so many. Your life's work dismantled in front of you. The Grim Knight remembers all of these things and he tightens his finger on the trigger to convince him that his plan was too easy. The Grim Knight explains that he wants Jim to see what they're going to do to this world. You're not Batman at all, Jim tells him. He can hear it in his voice. He doesn't believe in Gotham. The trigger pulls, the hammer drops, and a bony finger is there to stomp it. No, this isn't the way, the one who laughs tells him. But Jim doesn't understand why would he stop this? Why would the Batman who laughs deny the Grim Knight his revenge? But the Batman just laughs. This isn't about revenge. The Grim Knight is trying to show him mercy. What I have in store for you is far worse than death. <laughs>
And there you go, a shorter full story, but we wanted to try something, maybe combining some videos that are related to kind of give you a different full story experience. Next week, we'll be back to the normal full stories, bringing you a full compilation of old playlists. I hope you guys enjoy that. And uh, let me know what you think about this idea of just kind of grabbing older things. I thought about doing like X-Men Origins or doing Origins of Marvel Universe superheroes or all of the spider people, that kind of a thing. Either way, I want to know what you guys think and I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.